This episode is sponsored by Audible. The expansion and evolution of life is not impeded by the extinction of a species, rather when one door closes, another opens for someone new, or something. Today we're celebrating our 5th anniversary here on SFIA, and I thought we'd commemorate the occasion by revisiting one of our favorite topics, the Fermi Paradox, and specifically the line of reasoning we call the Dyson Dilemma that derives from our discussion of megastructures in the original episode 5 years ago. Wrapped up in the core reasoning of those ideas is the notion that extinction, while a popular notion for explaining the Fermi Paradox and the seeming absence of other civilizations in the galaxy, often drives life forward faster, rather than stopping the train or ending the story. Also, to celebrate the occasion, we'll go back to our roots with a very long episode, so grab a drink and a snack, hit the like and subscribe button, and settle in, as we'll be here for a while. Since we just did our 200th commemorative episode, we will skip much celebration this time, but non coincidentally, the original episode came out right before my birthday on September 20th, and the second episode sprung out of a chat I had on New Year's Eve. Birthdays and New Year's are good times for introspection and contemplating the past and planning the future, and unsurprisingly, led me to write up scripts about humanity's future. Our world rolls around the sun, and the seasons change and new stories begin even as chapters end, and while birthdays and calendar changes are admittedly rather arbitrary moments in time, they are a good one for reflection and deep thoughts. The concept of extinction is inextricably linked to this idea too, as most times things go extinct, it's because something else has risen up to replace them. We tend to think of species as being defined by a specific type of DNA. However, they're not a single exact sequence, but a broad zone of similar DNA, and that zone is often nearly as arbitrary as calendars, and that's a good comparison in this context because a species tends to occupy a distinct bit of space and time. In many ways extinction is what drives evolution, as much as the other way around, but it can be a troublesome concept when we try to think of it in terms of species which is honestly a bit of a hangover term from earlier eras of knowledge when we didn't know we were all related, down from some distant common ancestor billions of years ago. Such a time was so incomprehensible to us that we never even considered the world could be that old, probably part of the reason our ancestors, who were quite acquainted with mutation and breeding, never really contemplated shared ancestry until we started realizing just how ancient our world and our universe was. And indeed it's that very age, its sheer hugeness, and the incomprehensibility of such times to us at an intuitive level, that I tend to think causes so much problems contemplating the Fermi Paradox and its myriad proposed solutions, but I'm getting ahead of myself. No organism has identical DNA to another, not even twins, indeed your own DNA varies a little from cell to cell and from time to time as mutation is a constant thing. In an asexual organism, one that divides in two, species is an almost meaningless concept because everything branches like a tree at that point, never intertwining again. All those descendants just keep dividing and mutating and further diverging from one another. Indeed if we call such an asexually dividing organism a species, then one could argue that that very first organism, way back in the mists of early Earth, was a species and we are of that same species. We of course have names for categories of relation above species, like genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, and domain in ascending order, but it stops there because the category above is just life, and we only have Earth to look at, nothing of extraterrestrial origin. If we get into sexually reproducing organisms who can exchange DNA, then you don't get this constant divergence of clades, a group of organisms of common descent but an intertwining of those still genetically similar enough to reproduce, which we call a species. That's a bit blurry too, as for instance you can get hybrids of species like a lion and a tiger, the liger, but the normal way is for some prospering species to get two or more chunks of it fairly isolated from each other for many generations, so that crossbreeding shared mutations doesn't happen much, and grows less likely to occur or produce viable, fertile offspring. 
that original species is now essentially extinct, even though its descendants might be quite numerous and prosperous. Even without isolation creating distinct branches, you still eventually have the original species go extinct. Humans a million years from now, even without technological tinkering, probably couldn't breed with us even if nothing earth shattering in terms of mutation occurred, like an extra eyeball or finger, though of course with technological tinkering they probably could, and for advanced civilizations, even just at our level, genetic mutation really is no longer a big factor. We could, if we wish to, keep our basic gene template for billions of years, since DNA printing allows you to store that genetic data digitally and avoid the equivalent of copy fatigue. We could also of course go all in on genetic or cybernetic alterations, and we've discussed all those options before. Critically though, when we talk about extinction of high-tech or spacefaring civilizations, we usually mean a total wipeout, rather than the progressive change of slow mutation, which has a parallel for civilizations too. Folks like to talk about civilizations or empires falling, but this usually mirrors classic extinction, this or that empire moves its capital or a chunk of it separates off, or allies to a neighbor who conquers part of it and renames it. There are exceptions, but they are exceptions, not the rule, as folks often imply. It's very easy to argue that Rome never fell, any more than whatever common ancestors humans had with monkeys and apes went extinct, as there are almost countless modern and historical cultures and nations that claim to be its successor or at least its descendants, and the city that empire arose from might have been sacked, but it had been before and would be again and is now larger, more populous and prosperous than under even the greatest of the old emperors. So what does all this have to do with the Fermi Paradox? And what is the Fermi Paradox? I usually give an abridged form that it is the big question for why, in a universe so vast and ancient, we don't seem to see other civilizations all over the place. But there's some critical assumptions in there. One of those is the Dyson Dilemma, an abridgment of a note I scribbled down on a napkin one winter morning at breakfast with my friend Jason who was a sounding board for a lot of the concepts on the show. I rarely mention my friends or family in episodes to respect their privacy, but it seemed doubly appropriate to do so today since he had just started seriously dating a young lady at the time and they just got married a few weeks back, congratulations Jason and Christina. At the time we were continuing a conversation we had at his place on New Year's Eve, where my recent messing around on YouTube to discuss megastructures had come up and somehow we ended up discussing aliens and the Fermi Paradox. I mentioned how if megastructures offered a vastly more spacious and convenient alternative to terraforming relatively rare Earth-like planets, they should naturally progress to fully englobe a star, a Dyson Swarm as you could just keep adding them as needed and resources permitted. That even if we did colonize planets around distant alien suns, we'd likely repeat that process of englobement around them too as those distant colonies grew and built more and more of them to use every beam of stray sunlight. That even as that was happening, some pioneering sorts would doubtless decide to go stake a claim on the next empty solar system and repeat the process over and over until every star in the galaxy was fully englobed in Dyson Swarms. I noted that these Dysons are quite a dilemma for the Fermi Paradox, not just that we don't hear from distant alien civilizations around all those stars in the night sky, but that we can even see any of those stars since they ought to be shrouded inside a fog-like swarm of orbiting megastructures sipping at that sunlight. Essentially, that there are no advanced civilizations we can see inside our light cone, and thus probably none closer than a few billion light years. As I said, I'd been scribbling on napkins at the time and tucked them in my pocket, a habit of mine since my early days studying physics in college and I decided to make another video discussing this Dyson Dilemma of the Fermi Paradox. Not long after, I decided I really ought to list all the various solutions to the Fermi Paradox I knew and did yet another video and the rest, as they say, is history. A light cone, by the way, is essentially a distance or volume modified for the time it takes for light to reach you. We cannot observe events on Mars more recent than several minutes ago because light from there hasn't reached us yet to observe. 
or at our nearest stars more than several years ago. Needless to say, light from galaxies millions of light years away is millions of years old, so someone could be living there right now. Now when you're talking about swaths of Dyson Swarms, poor chunks of galaxies going black, or infrared anyway, you can see something like that out as far as the effective edge of the Universe, but out past a few billion light years you wouldn't expect an advanced civilization to have emerged yet when that light left. Regardless, we don't see any such thing, near or far, and we could if they existed, and we have looked. But you can't rule out life emerging after the most recent photons to reach us had left, so Andromeda, 2 million light years away, could have some galactic civilization by now. You can go from primitive tool using apes to galactic sprawl in that much time, and we ourselves probably will do just that in around that timeline. The thing is, it's all a stats game. A galactic civilization could have formed in Andromeda a million years ago, and the light from their expansion just not reached us yet. But if it were so common our nearest neighbor had such a civilization within a million years of our own, then many of the other galaxies a bit farther away ought to have one too, and one of those ought to be old enough to be in our light cone, as a few tens of millions of years is really nothing on astronomical timelines. If you double your search distance, that represents 8 times the volume and 8 times the stars or galaxies on this scale. If you look a hundred times further out, that's a million times more stars and galaxies, and indeed there's about a million times more stars in that volume than in our galaxy, which has hundreds of billions of them. Past that distance, where everything is over a billion years old when we see it, you can start arguing that the odds of a civilization has already arisen by then is pretty low, particularly as you know it has to be pretty low in the first place if there aren't tons of ancient galactic empires nearer. You don't see many stars with high metallicity much older than that, and you aren't likely to have a lot of large rocky planets like Earth around stars without high metallicity. We formed out of the same stuff the Sun was formed out of, but our gravity was too low to keep all that hydrogen and helium, leaving only the heavier elements behind. Go far enough back and you just don't get many rocky planets, maybe a few but again it's a stats game. If those rare handful of rocky planets way back could have evolved life and advanced civilizations, that implies it's so easy and likely to happen that we ought to be swimming in alien empires by now, many arising before our world even formed. The farther we look out from Earth, the more space there is in the distance, but the younger those galaxies were when they emitted the photons we see now. So life is far less probable to be in those earlier galaxies than it would be now, and if you go far enough out, vastly less likely. But the farther you go out, the more places and hence the more chances for civilizations to have formed, and the quantity will rise faster than the probability should drop, until you get so far away life just isn't plausible that early on. I don't know if dinosaurs would have evolved to be a civilization if they hadn't gone extinct. They were around as King of the Hill for around a hundred million years and didn't, but if we assumed every galaxy had formed only a few such species like that around a hundred million years ago, and only a few, well that's a million such examples inside our light cone that we'd be able to see if just one of them had built spaceships and sailed out to new worlds and Dyson swarmed them up, instead of going extinct, presumably with the help of an asteroid impact. Go back far enough in time and there just wouldn't be any plants to evolve on, but our planet isn't even vaguely at the beginning of the period that rocky worlds started becoming normal, and for the first billion years or more life was on Earth, it didn't do all that much. It's very easy to believe even worlds the same age as ours might have evolved into complexity just a couple hundred million years faster than we did. Based on what we know of astronomy and assuming we are fairly mediocre as evolution goes, we just have no reason to think someone couldn't have been at the level we are at now at least a billion years ago, and that would make so many galaxies candidates that you'd figure even if very few such civilizations ever went the Dyson route, we ought to see at least one. But we don't. And it makes so much sense to follow this strategy that you'd expect nearly everyone to do so not a small minority. After all, you can't climb up Darwin's ladder if you aren't biologically prone to growing your numbers. 
and that should generally give you that expansionist leaning. That's the extrapolation of the Dyson Dilemma, that because no one is apparently pursuing this strategy, they probably aren't because they don't exist. Technological civilizations are so darn rare that you'd have to scour at least millions of galaxies to find another example of it. That civilizations will tend to build up around their stars so much that they occlude it from view, in visual light anyway. They absorb that for power and re-emit it as waste heat in the infrared range. You and I can see stars, so if anyone lives there, they aren't very advanced yet. There are some assumptions about how civilizations work, and we've also discussed alternative but equivalent pathways in other episodes, like how a black hole centered civilization will still look like a Dyson Swarm because they take stars apart via star lifting to feed them into those black holes, but you can catch those episodes or the Dyson Dilemma episodes for the details. As mentioned though, there are a couple of assumptions there for the Dyson Dilemma. Beyond assuming that a given civilization has to desire to grow this way, they have to have both the capability to do so, and not have the capability to expand in some other, better fashion. One example that would break it is if someone developed a thermodynamics breaking technology that let them perfectly recycle waste heat, which might also obscure them from detectability by infrared waste heat. You only expand this way in the first place because you need more energy and raw materials if you want to expand, and there's countless billions of stars waiting nearby offering those to you. Another option then would be the ability to easily move to parallel universes, near-infinite uninhabited clones of their original homeworld, since there's no place like home and no point building massive interstellar generation ships if you can step through a portal to a copy of Earth where everything was the same but small apes haven't evolved yet or went extinct. Essentially, scenarios that give you a superior alternative to galactic expansion, though it should be noted that many of them folks suggest merely slow down when this would happen, such as going digital or miniaturizing. You don't need more space and resources because each person needs way less of them. The core assumption is that a growth-oriented group is going to grow exponentially as long as they can comfortably do so, and whether that rate is faster than it was last century for humanity, where we doubled our numbers twice, or that doubling takes thousands of years, that's nothing on astronomical timelines. A modern Earth-sized population only needs to double their numbers 70 times to fill an entire galaxy with fully populated Dyson Swarms so it would take us only 3500 years at 20th century growth rates. However, even if it took a million years to double, that's just 70 million years, nothing on galactic timelines. And something offering greater efficiency, like going digital and running your uploaded citizens on hyper-efficient amounts of power, is only going to add some extra doublings. Such a thing might actually speed up your timelines too since pathways like going digital usually imply operating at faster subjective speeds, so your generations might take mere days, even if to those folks it felt like centuries, and they went extinct in mere centuries, in the sense of being replaced by a new version. Not to mention it makes colonizing space way, way easier. See the Seeding the Stars episode for details. So you inevitably need some reason why your population growth drops off even when it offers no obvious advantage. Modern comparisons are tempting as our population growth has slowed in the 21st century, but even ignoring some dubious reasoning about causation and correlation attached to modern birth rates, it just doesn't apply to galactic expansion by a high-tech civilization. You're probably dealing with folks who do not age or grow less fertile with age, who do not have to worry about priorities of kids versus career, and who do not feel any particular resource pressure with an unused galaxy at their fingertips. If you're 200 years old, souped up on physical and mental augmentation so that you probably qualify as a genius by modern standards, have a lifestyle that would make a modern millionaire look like a beggar but are still considered rather young and middle class for your era, your basic biological strategies on reproduction just aren't the same as now. You can basically have as many kids as you want, if you want, and some folks will want just that, probably most. 
If you live centuries in a resource-rich, labor-low civilization, you can wait till you're centuries old to have kids, the equivalent of a modern millionaire with multiple doctorates, and focus on only one kid at a time, and still have dozens of them, and raise them in ideal conditions. Keeping those kind of factors in mind, there either has to be a dynamic in play that disinclined all advanced civilizations to adopt no-growth policies universally, or you have only a temporary hiatus on growth until some faction of that civilization that is pro-growth has enough time to become the majority and the prior no-growth elements go effectively extinct. So as long as there's no compelling reason to encourage folks to have few kids, you keep heading back to the notion that some will have a bunch and will pass that tendency on to their own kids, and you end up again with a society that favors growth at least until it runs into some other compelling reason not to grow, and that takes us right back to the Dyson Dilemma. The Dyson Dilemma, incidentally, is not a Fermi Paradox solution itself, it's just a problem most Fermi Paradox solutions have no good answer for. In fact the only one that does is the solution that just says advanced civilizations either rarely develop or life rarely evolves to complexity or worlds life could evolve on are super rare the rare earth or rare intelligence or rare technology camps. None of these are exclusive by the way, it could be earth-like planets are fairly rare and the evolutionary path to complexity and intelligence rarely got followed and that not many of those intelligences go on to abstract thinking and also to inventing serious technology. And there are many steps along the way, many hurdles, some of which may filter out most worlds. We call these hurdles filters and they can be minor things, coin flip odds, or major ones few worlds would pass, or even lottery odd ones, what we call great filters, and you can see the great filter series for further discussion of those. For those curious, while I have no official stance on the Fermi Paradox, too many unknowns still, I tilt to rare technology and consider that the best stance on available data, or the least worst one anyway that spacefaring technological civilizations, the only kind we could detect right now, seem to be absent. I've no idea why, maybe intelligent life only develops on one in a quadrillion planets, but once it happens technology is inevitable and there's billions of worlds in our galaxy alone covered in simple algae or its alien equivalents. Or life only kindles under such rare conditions, it's only happened a few times in the whole universe, but inevitably proceeds to a galaxy-spanning civilization when it does. Maybe intelligence isn't nearly as advantageous to life as we tend to assume, and most times when something develops it, it isn't worth the energy bill to run such a big brain and they go extinct. We don't know, but I tend to guess there's a lot of little filters that each lower the odds and a few big or great filters too. We just know such technological civilizations appear to be very rare, That again is the point of the Dyson Dilemma. One popular alternative related to this idea that civilizations are rare is that they actually are not, they just don't turn into galaxy-spanning ones much. That civilizations just tend to stay at home rather than spread out, and we could easily miss them then so long as they aren't super common, since the Dyson Dilemma is about looking for huge dark blobs of millions of darkened suns in the middle of galaxies or galaxy-sized spots emitting tons of infrared light. Another is that they have access to physics-breaking technologies, what we call clock tech, like my earlier example of being able to violate the laws of thermodynamics, or just meander off or ascend to some higher planes of existence, which we'll look at more next week in Aloof Aliens. The other option, of course, is that they do want to expand and grow, but they go extinct. Critical to this whole idea is that a species can travel to and colonize other stars, and that they have a tendency to grow in numbers and expand. It's hard to do that if you get wiped out, but as I was saying earlier, species extinction rarely means that and when it does, it either means an ultra-catastrophe or that it was out-competed by something better at survival. We looked at some of the possible catastrophes that might hit interplanetary or interstellar civilization some weeks back and the only plausible options that work with the Fermi Paradox are those where it's sort of an inevitable convergence. An example, though a bad one, would be a tendency to make computers and artificial intelligence and be wiped out by that AI. That's a bad example, 
not because it would be super implausible if almost every advanced species made AI and got hammered by it, but because it still leaves you an AI. That species is extinct, but that AI is still around. Homo erectus is gone but Homo sapiens remain, Rome burned down but Constantinople is flourishing, the humans are all dead but Skynet is busy colonizing the galaxy. So in that regard, extinction only works as a Fermi Paradox solution if it is both going to end with nothing left with colonial or growth tendencies and is virtually inevitable. We have a concept called non-exclusivity that comes up in Fermi Paradox discussion here a lot, and it's the basic notion that any solution that can't plausibly apply to every likely case is not a good one. Asteroids might wipe out a civilization, though not an advanced one which will regard an approaching asteroid as a great economic boon, but statistically not many civilizations would get hit with Earth killers. Indeed the only time we had one was probably when we got slugged by that hypothetical dwarf planet that gave us our moon. The one that allegedly wiped out the dinosaurs would not wipe us out, just set us back a few generations. And indeed it may not have wiped them out either or just been a contributing factor to a long process already in progress for millions of years. Assuming it even was a factor, not just an event that happened to occur during around the same million year swath of time they left the scene, if that was the case that they would have stayed the king of the hill, then maybe they'd not have evolved high intelligence, they arguably weren't well designed for improving in that regard. That freak extinction may have removed a strong player who was a dead end, but too strong to have otherwise died off. Alternatively, if they could have, that just raises the whole issue again of someone getting a jump start on us. 65 million years is a big head start. We'll probably have swarmed over not just our galaxy, but our whole local cluster by then, and we would expect anyone nearby who had that head start to have long since done so and be rather visible to us now particularly as they might have colonized Earth, in which case I guess they wouldn't be visible to us, but only because we wouldn't be here to see them. Similar things apply to most extinction events, even when we say it was sudden we mean on geological timelines. Of course some might have been rather sudden, that asteroid case or a super plague, or if a species only lives on one specific island and a volcano erupts. Another good reason to colonize the galaxy, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. But for extinction in general, normally it's a gradual falloff to mutation and competition. This doesn't work well for advanced civilizations and the Fermi Paradox. First, because once you're interstellar, it's really hard to have a natural calamity kill everyone off. Truth be told, it really shouldn't be possible even once you're genuinely interplanetary, since unless your own sun goes supernova, which it won't since such stars live way too briefly to even let their planets form and cool down enough for life to even think about starting, you're going to have stuff survive, even if it's a handful of asteroid or comet mining colonies buried deep under the protective layers of rock or ice. Second, because fundamentally the same principle applies as with species expanding out from an origin spot on a fertile continent. They don't need to be coordinated, it doesn't matter if one's still living at the origin spot all around, and the chunks of that original group that most favor growth and expansion are going to be the ones who make the most of it and probably pass that trade on to their descendants, until and unless they encounter something that makes them revise that policy. And there may be such things in our future, but none of the suggested candidates seem to hold up, especially in the face of non-exclusivity. Again the notion and individual scenario has to apply to everybody, every strange and diverse alien, for it to work. Otherwise stuff can go extinct but generally just gets replaced by something tougher and more aggressive or expansionist. Don't assume that means nasty or locust-like. Aggressively colonizing sterile dead planets so you can fill them with life, or some post-biological equivalent, is the exact opposite of locust-like behavior. I think my habit of talking about tearing apart planets to build space habitats, to build Dyson Swarms, sometimes conjures that rapacious locust swarm to folks' mind. It's not that locusts are evil of course, or that we are really nice, they're just really dumb. Of course sometimes so are we, 
but generally our expansion approaches are rather more long term and getting longer all the time. This incidentally is why we assume most alien species will be expansion oriented, fast or slow, violently aggressive or peaceful. In nature, you don't exist as a species for long if you don't manage to birth and mature enough offspring to replace your numbers, and any branch of your species which does that more or better will rapidly replace the others too. This doesn't mean you spawn littles or lay thousands of eggs any more than humans do, just that your pre-technological origins have to be able to replace your numbers and probably also keep up with some expansion into unexploited areas. This means tribes that get a bit big and have lots of free territory nearby can divide up, and keep doing that till they get all the good spots. Key point though, they have to be able to replace their numbers or they go extinct, and since pretty much all the early applications of technology are about making it easier not to die, they will have a surplus of people being born. Overpopulation is nothing new. And truth be told, even though we are more numerous than ever before, we actually are less pressured by that than our ancestors usually have been, since we have been technologically boosting our carrying capacity, how many people we can support off a given chunk of territory, much faster, and also have technologically made accidental increases in population less common. Nature has plenty of ways of dealing with overpopulation, as did pre-modern human cultures, Like I said, not a new problem. It just doesn't work out from a Fermi Paradox perspective, going extinct from a decline in birth rates. There's no pressure to discouraging expansion that really makes much sense. If you have the technology for sailing off to new worlds or building them, and if your population is just declining because folks don't like having kids and so you don't bother colonizing, Eventually, some group or faction is going to be all for big families again and after a handful of generations, they'll outnumber everyone else. That original culture basically went extinct, but merely to be replaced by one that liked big families again, and that might go out of style in a place and time where population pressure arose again. For that matter, you've got all sorts of technological options for rapidly boosting your population if you need to and it seems improbable a high-tech civilization would just have extinction from low birth rates sneak up on them and not attempt any of the many obvious solutions for avoiding that, potentially even including mass cloning or uploading mines and duplicating them. You can do that same trick if you have the technology for colonizing other stars, but life is so utopian back home no one really wants to go. You just find a decent, small sample of willing and able colonists, say a few thousand, and randomly copy and send a group of a thousand of them off to each new world, the originals can even stay home in Utopia if they like. They'll diverge so much in those unique settings and groups, they'll be all new people anyway, and their kids will be too. They all diverge and evolve on those new worlds under alien suns. We looked at that option more in Mind Uploading last year. This is the fundamental idea though, extinction doesn't usually end life and growth, but rather drives it on to more of both. On those rare occasions it's by cataclysm and genuinely results in a scenario where something is wiped out and not replaced by something better at survival and growth, advanced civilizations would mostly be immune to those anyway. And unless there is some inevitable suicide pack technology everyone discovers, like some awesome seeming power source you will always discover and always use without realizing it will kill you off before it's too late, then non-exclusivity would apply. Some might die that way but not all and not most. But even if it were most, or nearly all, you only need that one civilization that can expand and likes to do so to swarm the whole galaxy over, or many galaxies and they will get every star, not just those with an Earth-like planet, and they won't really care that much about such planets anyway, because they can build better places to live. Last week we noted how hard it is to terraform a planet like Mars, and I mentioned then that it's easy to build habitats instead, and of course our original episode, five years ago, was a summary of some of the cooler such megastructures you can build, and we later expanded that into a series focusing on each one. The planet-centric focus of a lot of science fiction was part of the reason the channel started, 
as I wanted to encourage more authors to feature these sort of artificial worlds, or the sort of massive ships and structures advanced civilizations could build, and few authors tended to look at. There are some exceptions, Larry Niven's Ringworld maybe being the best known, but nobody really explores it like the late Ian M. Banks does in his cultural series, beginning with Consider Phlebas. He not only gives us a look at such giant constructs, but contemplates the kinds of civilizations, or cultures, that might build and live on such things. A lot like we do on the show, he tries to see how a given technology, from the very plausible and mundane to outright clock tech, alter a culture and its members' outlook on life. Banks' cultural series is one of the biggest influences on this show, and one of the handful of books mentioned way back in the original episode, and it's past time he won our Book of the Month. You can get a free copy of Consider Phlebas at audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500 Audible offers a 30 day free trial, but each month you're a member you now get a free audiobook and two Audible Originals, and those credits roll over to the next month or year and stay yours, along with any books you got even if you later discontinue your membership. And with their convenient app, you can listen on any of your devices and seamlessly pick up where you left off, whether you're listening at home, commuting, running errands, or off jogging or at the gym. Audible makes it cheap and easy to access a vast collection of amazing stories. Another thing the cultural series likes to look at is the notion that spacefaring civilizations tend to leave behind the mortal universe and sublime, or ascend to another plane of existence or something similar, and we'll be looking at that and some related notions next week as we return to the Alien Civilization series with Aloof Aliens. Banks also gives us some interesting looks at the sort of extreme environment and spacesuits you might need to live some places, like walking around on Venus, and we'll explore spacesuits and extreme environments in two weeks to look at some of the challenges in making better suits and some options advances in technology might give us for some really awesome ones, before heading to Venus to look at how we might go about terraforming that molten hot world in Winter on Venus. If you'd like to help support 5 more years of episodes like that, we'd appreciate your support and you can go on to our website, IsaacArthur.net, to see some of the options, from Patreon to PayPal to buying some awesome channel merchandise, or even sending it by snail mail, and for the record, I am always delighted to get postcards, or given the date, birthday cards. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.